Good morning <laughs> from Provo, Utah. And uh, it's our pleasure to welcome you to this uh, webinar, a uh, webcast uh, from the National Middle East Language Resource Center. Uh, we are very pleased to welcome Dr. Nicole Mills from Harvard University with us today and, uh, and uh, excited for this presentation on self-efficacy and foreign language learning. This is part of Project Perseverance, our project that it aims to help students press forward in, in reaching their foreign language learning goals. And um, without further ado, I'll turn the time over to her. Well, thank you very much, and thank you so much for having me here. I'm delighted to be here at Brigham Young and also virtually um, to speak with you about self-efficacy in foreign language education, something that has interested me for quite some time. Um, so I'm trying to change. <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. Sure that, no. Is that your work? So you got to make sure that it's over there. Ah, okay. Fantastic. Okay, so just to provide you with an overview of my presentation, the first thing I'm going to talk about is what is self efficacy? Then, what does self efficacy do? Where does it come from? What are current uh, areas of self efficacy research? How would you assess self-efficacy in the foreign language classroom? How do you assess it? What are the results of self-efficacy research in foreign language learning in particular? How does current self-efficacy research link to the teaching of less commonly taught languages? And then how can you foster self-efficacy in the less commonly taught language classroom and in the more commonly taught language classroom? Um, so what is self-efficacy? The first question. Um, well, self-efficacy is grounded within social cognitive theory, which talks about how individuals possess a system of self-beliefs that enable them to exercise control over their thoughts, feelings, and actions. So this is a little bit different from, so this is a distinctly human capability, that we have the ability to control our thoughts, we have the ability to control our feelings, and we also have the ability to control our actions. Um, grounded in this, within this theory is self-efficacy. So this is kind of a fancy definition. The fancy definition being people's judgments of their capabilities to organize and execute courses of action required to attain designated types of performances. This is from Albert Bandura at Stanford University who has sort of coined the self-efficacy term. Um, basically, self-efficacy is people's judgments of their capabilities to complete particular tasks. So their perceived confidence in their ability to complete particular tasks. And you can see this is an article from the Wall Street Journal stating, "Can do you want to succeed in life? Try some self-efficacy. Um, so the idea being that what people think, what people believe, and what people feel affects how they behave. Um, What's very interesting about self-efficacy is they talk about how it's often a better predictor of success than actual abilities. Um, so previous success is, is not as good of a predictor of actual success than actually your perceived ability. Um, beginning in 1996, Graham and Weiner did a extensive review of motivational research in the educational realm, and they found that student self-efficacy more consistently predicted academic performance over and above other motivational constructs. So self-efficacy above and beyond anxiety, above and beyond perceived value, above and beyond self-concept, um, and other types of motivational constructs, self-efficacy was the biggest predictor of achievement. So, great voices of self-efficacy. So, Alba Bandura was not the first person to talk about this. Um, a great voice of self-efficacy is Virgil, um, who stated they are able who think they are able. Um, another great voice of self-efficacy is Alexandre Dumas, who stated, a man who doubts himself is like a man who enlists in the ranks of his enemies and bear arms against himself. He makes failure certain by him being the first convinced of it. Um, another great voice of self-efficacy is Henry Ford. Um, whether you think that you can or you can't, you're usually right. Mm -hmm. um, 
<clears throat> Mahatma, Gan Mahatma Gandhi um, talked about, uh, if I have the belief that I can do it, I shall surely acquire the capacity to do it, even if I may not have it at the beginning. And then finally, I wanted to talk about uh, Frank Baharis, who was a former associate professor of educational psychology at Emory University. He was one of my advisors um, when I was doing my graduate research, and sadly he passed away. But he was an avid researcher of self-efficacy in academic contexts. In um, one of his quotes is, clearly it is not a simple, simply a matter of how capable one is, but how capable one believes oneself to be. Um, so, just give you an, a little bit of idea of sort of the construct of self-efficacy and what it is about. Now, what does self-efficacy do? Um, well, self-efficacy, as we talked about a little bit, influences people's courses of actions and their decisions. It influences how much effort you're going to expend when you're doing a particular task. It influences your level of perseverance. And then your resilience to adversary, adversity when you're in the face of obstacles. Um, it influences affective states, meaning it influences your emotions, your feelings. And it influences also the degree of success realized. And where does it come from? So now that we know what it is, what it does, where does it come from? Well, there are four main overarching sources of self-efficacy. One of them being mastery experiences, another vicarious experiences, emotional states, and social and verbal persuasion. So I'm going to talk about each one of these separately. Um, so the first, if you see that little baby um, in that picture there, um, the idea that um, mastery experiences are successful experiences. So mastery experiences are outcomes perceived as successful. So when you're doing a particular task, are you successful at it? Um, if you perceive yourself as successful, that's going to raise your self-efficacy. If you interpret a task as a failure or you're less competent at that particular task, you perceive yourself as not being successful, that's going to lower the self-efficacy. So what happens is individuals engage in activities, they think about the results of their actions. They interpret it. They say, huh, how well was I? How, how well did I do that task? How, how successful was I? And then they develop beliefs about their capabilities to do future tasks, future activities from those. Vicarious experiences is another source. So observations of others, particularly peers, people that you deem as peers, plays a very critical role. You might look at someone, a peer, and seeing him or he, he or she perform a particular task, and you say, hey, I can do that too. Um, and modeling, therefore, plays a really, a really large role in self-efficacy. Emotions and feelings. So how you feel, what do you feel? What is your emotion while you're performing a particular task? Um, negative thoughts and fears while you're doing a particular task are going to often link to first lower self-efficacy and later ensure inadequate performance. Um, so you can see this sort of um, correlation between anxiety, low self-efficacy, and then low performance. Um, verbal persuasions. So this is an interesting um, this is an interesting source. This is feedback from others, typically Teachers and mentors play a very critical role um, in terms of um, enhancing self-efficacy. Positive persuasions are going to encourage and empower and going to enhance self-efficacy, and ne negative persuasions can often defeat and weaken self-efficacy beliefs. Now, this doesn't mean that we're going to want to constantly provide others with positive persuasions when they're not warranted. Um, the idea behind this is to, to, as a mentor, as a teacher, is to think very carefully about providing appropriate, rigorous, but yet non-debilitating feedback. So finding that balance. All right, so what are the current areas of self-efficacy research? So I'm sort of talking about self-efficacy in, in its general form right now. Um, we're going to see that self-efficacy research exists in a lot of different areas. It exists in 
career. They do research on career self-efficacy, sports self-efficacy. I know someone that's written a book, a book about golf and self-efficacy. Um, self-efficacy in diet, self-efficacy in pain management, parental self-efficacy, depression, gender gaps in self-efficacy, and then moving into the academic context, we see teacher and student self-efficacy. So this is not something that's sort of grounded within uh, the academic context. It's actually quite widely researched and explored in a variety of different contexts. So why would you assess self-efficacy in the foreign language classroom? You know, how, why, would, how, why would that help you? Why would you be interested in doing something like that? Well, there are a lot of reasons that I've come up with um, and I found really helpful with self-efficacy. Um, one thing is you can evaluate students' perceived competence in the course objectives. So you can sort of pinpoint what your course objectives are and then evaluate students' perceived competence in them. You could do this at the beginning of the course. Maybe explore where students feel competent and less competent and then tailor your curriculum accordingly. Um, you could evaluate the influence of a new pedagogical approach on student self-efficacy. So maybe you're interested in trying a new approach to the curriculum and you want to see how this influence stu influences student self-efficacy. You can evaluate it at the beginning of the semester and then you can also evaluate it at the end of the semester. Um, you can look at the influence of pedagogical, pedagogical interventions such as workshops on students or even teacher self-efficacy. So um, this past summer I worked with Star Talk, which is a, um, um, a federally granted program, federal, which is, comes from a federal grant and it was a program for um, teacher training in Persian in curriculum development. So what we did is we mm -hmm. sort of highlighted our goals for that particular teacher workshop and then we assessed, um, using self-efficacy, the teacher's perceived capabilities of performing particular tasks in curriculum development at the beginning and then at the end to see if we were tapping at our goals. Thankfully, we were. Um, but if we weren't, it would be a good place for us to sort of revisit our teacher training program and try to enhance um, accordingly. Um, you could also look at the evalu evaluate the influence of teacher teaching learning strategy techniques. So maybe you want to um, teach your students different strategies in listening comprehension, and then you want to uh, then later evaluate their self-efficacy to listen. Um, also, a, a study that I've been involved in is longitudinal evalu evaluation of self-efficacy beliefs. Um, particularly with the language requirements. So starting at the beginning, beginning courses, beginning two, intermediate one, intermediate two, you can move all the way up to advanced, how are student self-efficacy beliefs evolving or not? Um, so there's a lot of different ways that self-efficacy can really help you um, in the foreign language classroom. So how do you assess it? So uh, I'm going to show you one simple way to assess self-efficacy and then I'm going to show you some examples of different research studies. So how do you assess self-efficacy quantitatively? Well, you could create self-efficacy questionnaires where you phrase questions in terms of can do as opposed to will do. So for example, you could say something like how certain are you that you can dot 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 and then a list of targeted tasks that are closely linked to the outcome measure or the outcome objectives that you have for your particular classroom or program. Um, I, I have been working with a scale from 0 to 100 because it's been found that this is more psychometrically valid because individuals and particularly students are more capable of understanding the notion of 80% competent or 75% competent as opposed to a Likert scale from 0 to 6, for example, which is a little harder to sort of figure out your rate of competence. So I use a scale from 0 to 100. Um, so that would be a way to evaluate um, self-efficacy. Now, whether it was the results of self-efficacy research in foreign language learning? Well, so I have I have a variety of different references that I have also, I believe they'll be available online. 
Um, and these are just a few. Um, but student self-efficacy believes there's, I, I've done research on the self-efficacy of intermediate students and how it relates to their achievement. So this particular study found that self-efficacy was highly correlated to achievement in intermediate level French students. Um, I also did a study self-efficacy and anxiety and the relationship between self-efficacy and anxiety in terms of reading and listening proficiency. So that's another area. Um, another study was evaluating the influence of project-based learning on students' self-efficacy in the standards of foreign language learning. So another sort of area. Um, one of them that I'm going to highlight today is global simulation and the writing self-beliefs of intermediate French students. This was a um, study I conducted with a colleague of mine at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, Melanie Perron. Um, and then longitudinal perceptions of efficacy and value in the French language requirement. So this is sort of that longitudinal study in which I followed students from the beginning level courses through the end of the intermediate level to see how their self-efficacy had evolved in the standards of foreign language learning. There's other research by Graham in particular where she studied learning strategies and self-efficacy, which are those are two very interesting studies. And then I've had I've, I've done research three different articles on teacher self-efficacy, and I'm going to talk about one example today: um, uh, teacher self-efficacy of native versus non-native speakers, teacher self-efficacy in literature of teaching assistants in French. I'm going to talk about this study today. And then a most more recent study is Action Research Bridging Theory and Practice, so um, a master's level uh, course in which teachers were engaged in action research in the classroom and a qualitative research interview study in which I sort of explored how their self-efficacy beliefs evolved and the sources of their self-efficacy as a result of that experience. Um, so I'm going to focus on three sample research studies today. And while I'm talking about them, I just they're just here to sort of give you food for thought um, as to how this could potentially apply to your context, maybe how this could work within um, your classroom, your program. Uh, so the first one is the global simulation and the writing self-beliefs of intermediate students. The second one is longitudinal perceptions of efficacy and value. And then the third is teaching assistant self-efficacy and teaching literature. Two quantities qualitative studies and one qualitative. So <clears throat> if you have the general question of how can you evaluate the influence of a new pedagogical approach or a new curriculum on student self-efficacy, this was a, a more general question and this was sort of a targeted study of, of how I wanted to, went about answering that question. Last year I did a webinar on global simulation so um, if, if anyone was present for that, this will, this will definitely make a lot of sense. And if you're not, I'm just, I'll just give you a highlight. Um, but global simulation, um, global simulation is a curricular format in which students create a fictive yet culturally grounded world and they take on the role of a self-developed character and they collaborate with their fellow community members. So in this particular class, the class took, pla took place in Paris and the course was entirely grounded within Paris and at the same time each student was living virtually in a building in Paris and they developed a character and all of the students in the building were neighbors and they wrote from the perspective of their memoirs throughout the course. Um, so while they're learning about the culture of Paris and various aspects of that culture, they were developing a collective storyline. Right? That's sort of the very quick version of that. So what my interest was, was how global simulation influenced the development of their writing self-efficacy beliefs. And writing self-efficacy beliefs are their judgments of their competence in writing, um, their ability to write different types of writing tasks and the possession of different types of skills. So what I did was, um, I was the, the coordinator of the intermediate level at the time, and this participants included about 134 students enrolled in Intermediate French 1 in this particular curriculum. We evaluated writing self-efficacy at the beginning and at the end of the semester. So to give you an idea, um, 
we first looked at how we're grading them. What are our outcomes? What are we looking for? So we were grading the students on content, grammar, creativity, expression, and organization. So now knowing that, what we then did was we put together a list of writing self-efficacy items associated with each of these outcome measures. So a sample item might be, how sure are you that you can write in French about a variety of topics with precision and detail? How sure are you that you can describe experiences fully when writing in French? How sure are you that you can present arguments or points of view accurately and effectively when writing in French? Um, and again, from a 0 to 100, students would answer this question. Um, expression, how sure are you that you can write in French with a variety and complexity of structures? How sure are you that you can write in French and use a wide range of vocabulary? Um, grammar, how sure are you that you can write in French with a good control and of a full range of grammatical structures, make few conjugation errors, grammar errors, etc. Organization, how sure are you that you can write with an underlying logical organization, write with a clear sense of beginning and closure? And creativity, how sure are you that you can write in French with creativity and interest engage the reader when writing in French? So what we did was we asked the students to complete this before, at the beginning of the semester, and then at the end of the semester. Um, I used a statistical program called SPSS. However, I think if you wanted to do this in a le and you didn't want to report it for research purposes, it was for only for your own personal interest, you could certainly use Excel and, and do this on your own. Um, Pre-test and post-test, and what we found was that there were significant differences in the students writing self-efficacy in all of these areas, including writing self-efficacy as a whole. Um, so we could see from the beginning to the end of the semester that we were engaged in um, enhancing <coughs> their writing self-efficacy. So we were excited to see those results. Um, and then what's nice about this is after you get results like this, you can really start to then reflect and think about why. So what are the implications, and why did, why could maybe global simulation enhance their self-efficacy? So then we started to say, okay, well, why did this enhance their self-efficacy to write creatively? Well, we had, we there was a, a creative nature to the type of writing assignments that they were assigned. They were collectively developed. Um, they had a choice of topics in terms of how they wanted to direct the storyline, which allowed them to be um, to, to explore, um, which we believe led to higher motivation. And they had a liberation from their own identity. They weren't writing from their own perspective. So this allowed for um, the exploration of a new, altered, or desired self, which potentially enhanced their self-efficacy. So another question, why might it enhance their self-efficacy to write in an organized matter? Well, there was consistent writing practice. So through these memoirs, they were writing consistently. At the same time, they were also revising consistently. We also included a lot of guiding comments on the students' first drafts associated with organization. And they were also writing workshops associated with organization. So that could have played a role. Other things, um, why might global simulation enhance their self-efficacy to write with grammatical accuracy? Well. The first thing is, is that the first draft was worth 30 points, the second draft was worth 70 points. So the first draft we graded on grammatical accuracy, but only grammatical accuracy that they were capable of controlling. Conjugation errors that we knew that they could check on their own. Spelling, that they knew that if they looked up the words and checked the spelling, they could do that themselves, they could do well. An agreement, masculine or feminine, of all the nouns. If they wanted to do well, they could do well. At the same time, we did not take points off for things that were out of their control, such as um, challenging grammatical structures that maybe they don't know how to do yet. So this allowed them to be a little bit more creative at the beginning and then later on um, fix that grammar. So uh, we, we think that that sort of may have helped with that. Um, and then how or why might it enhance student self-advocacy to appropriately communicate content? Well, 
there was this personal investment in the character's identity, so they really wanted to make sure that <coughs> their character's voice was heard and their character's story was interesting. Um, there was a progressive development of the complexity of the character throughout the global simulation experience. Um, there was a choice of topics that really tried to hook the students and enhance the content of the collective storyline. And again, they were provided with choice as to where the story would go. And then lastly, um, why might it enhance student self-efficacy to write with enhanced expression? Well, we were really trying to help them and liberate them from elementary level French writing, where they're engaged in simple sentence structures, simple ideas, and we really wanted to push them out of their comfort zone and try to express themselves in the target language in similar ways as they're doing when they're writing in English. So all of a sudden, um, we gave them that liberty to do so by not take, by not penalizing them for errors in that area on the first on the first draft. Um, so we really helped to develop. Uh, their expression also with our comments that we gave as well. So in any case, this what self-efficacy allowed us to do is not only see how students writing self-efficacy beliefs developed or were enhanced, but it also allowed us to sort of reflect on why, um, which was helpful for us, for me as a coordinator, and I think it was also helpful for our instructors as well. Um, so another question. So now moving on to another type of study. So how can we use self-efficacy to assess students' perceived development in the five C's of the standards of foreign language learning from the beginning to the end of the language requirement? So a study that I worked on, um, this was at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, the title of it was Longitudinal Perceptions of Efficacy and Value in the Language Requirement. So I studied two things. The first was longitudinal perceptions of perceived value. So what did they perceive valuable in terms of the standards of foreign language learning? What did they want to learn? Um, so that was the first question. And did that change throughout the language requirement? The second question that I had was, um, are there perceptions of efficacy in culture, cultural products, their understanding of cultural products, and their ability to communicate on an interpersonal level? Um, did that evolve? And if not, why not? And if it did, why? So, so these were sort of the main questions that I had. So is there a change in their self-efficacy to communicate in French? from the beginning to the end of the language requirement. For us, in that university, the language requirement was, um, well, depending on what level you came in on, but it could go from beginning French 1 up into intermediate French 2. So um, is there a change in their self-efficacy or the understanding of the practices, perspectives, and products of French culture? Is there a change in their self-efficacy to make connections between French and other disciplines, history, um, politics, etc. Is there a change in their self-efficacy to understand the lang French language and culture through comparisons to their own? And was there a change in their self-efficacy to participate in Francophone communities at home and around the world? So I had two different types of sequences. I had one sequence that was just beginning French 1 through intermediate French 2. I had another sequence that was French for false beginners. This was an interesting course that I um, took on when I was there. French for False Beginners is a course with a whole very variety of different types of students. These are students that have seen French before. They might have been away from it for a very long time. They need to brush up. So it's a review of the entire elementary curriculum in one semester. Um, and it's a whole hodgepodge of different types of students. So that course, then Intermediate French 1, then Intermediate French 2. So similar to what I did before, uh, very similar idea, except now within the standards of foreign language learning. Um, how sure you that you can, and in terms of interpersonal communication, um, and this moving from a very simple type task, I can introduce someone and use basic greetings, to a more challenging interpersonal oral task, I can active and actively participate in the debate. 
So these are only sample items, so they ranged from the simple to the more complex. Um, you can see interpersonal needs in writing terms of, in terms of uh, participating in extended written chat conversations. Um, interpretive communication, same idea. I can understand literary text with a basic vocabulary and a simple, straightforward plot is one sample item. Or I can understand the details of most TV shows. I can understand the main ideas of a short documentary. So again, all of the tasks move from very simple to more complex. Um, presentational communication, I can write a review of a short film, or I can give a prepared presentation about a cultural topic. Um, I'm familiar with the role. This is uh, culture. So I'm familiar with the role of contemporary figures in French or Francophone culture. I can describe customs and traditions of the target culture. I can recognize important monuments and symbols of uh, French and Francophone culture. Connections, I can relate content from other subject areas to those discussed in class. I can discuss how members of the French culture view the United States. Um, I can, comparisons, I can compare and contrast social conventions of the target culture with those of my own. I can analyze and explain local, regional, national differences in the countries where French is spoken and compare it to my own country. So, those are just some sample items. Um, the survey itself was actually quite long. I think there may have been over a hundred items. Um, so, this can just show you before self-efficacy beliefs before and after beginning French one. So you can see how they were divided, pre-test, post-test. But what I want to show you here is what was more interesting for for me was to look at how self-efficacy and communication sort evolved from the beginning to the end of beginning trend of beginning one beginning two intermediate one intermediate two you can see a little bit of a dip at the, after the end and towards the beginning typically there may have been a summer involved there so maybe their self-efficacy beliefs dipped a little bit um, there could have been a winter break <laughs> but in any case you can see sort of um, you can see the evolution there we had a significant, statistically significant changes um, from the beginning to the end of each, and also with the sequence, all of the courses as well. Um, we were able to see, we were able to sort of break it down at the end of the language requirement, how competent they felt in the different areas of communication, the different modes of communication. We found that the, they felt most competent in their ability to, to um, the interpersonal mode in writing. Um, and also interpersonal mode in speaking, they also felt quite confident. Interper interpretive mode in listening, however, they perceived that <clears throat> not as competent as the other modes. And that's something that we really thought about a lot, whether or not we needed to um, enhance that more in the curriculum. Self-efficacy and culture. So we can again see um, the progression from the beginning to the end. There were st statistically significant changes from the beginning to the end of each course, as well as within the sequence. Oh, excuse me. And what we were also able to do is sort of break it down between practices, products, and perspectives. And so what I could see is that there was a mean change of 40 points in cultural practices from the beginning to the end. Cultural perspectives, the mean change was 35 points. We could see that self-efficacy and culture means at the end of the language requirement were highest in terms of cultural practices, but a little bit lower in terms of cultural perspectives. And that was something that we also thought about a bit. Um, what does that mean for us? What might we need to adjust? What might we need to adapt? Self-efficacy and connection. So this is their, self their, their perceived ability to make connections from what they're learning in their language class to other courses. So we can again see we were making um, progress there in terms of their perceived ability. Same thing with comparisons. Comparisons between the target language and culture to their own we were also seeing um, development. Communities as well. Um, <clears throat> their ability to um, participate in a French-speaking community. 
So what was also interesting was once we had that sort of mass information, we could look and sort of break it down into different, um, different pieces. So we could explore a little bit. So this was a very interesting find. Um, I looked at the mean change for men and the mean change for women from the beginning to the end of the language requirement. Now, self-efficacy in culture, there was, there was a 27-point mean change for men, but there was a 48-point mean change for women. Interesting. Um, we're, we're still trying to sort of figure out what was happening here. Um, Self-efficacy and connections, 13 points, but a 40.8 point change for women. Self-efficacy and comparisons, 8 points, 42 point mean change. Um, Self-efficacy in communities, 10 point change for men, and 37.8 change for women. Now, what was interesting is that the their perceived self-efficacy was not different, but the mean change was different. That makes sense. Okay? Um, so this was something that we were interested in exploring, and I think if we were to do qualitative, a qualitative follow-up study with interviews with the men and women, we would have been able to find more information, and I think that still should and could be done. Um, Another thing, so targeting course objectives, examples of French 121. So this is French for false beginners. Um, so what I was able to do, in addition to looking at, in general, cultural perspectives at the beginning and at the end, we could also look at the targeted item and evaluate that independently. So let me show you an example. So what we found was that um, there, was a, there were gains made in cultural understanding. There was a mean increase of 24 points from the beginning to the end of the semester. Um, but they did not perceive themselves as competent in cultural understanding as they did in communication. So this is something we were able to take a look at. Now, thinking back at the course, being the coordinator of that course, that course was very heavily grammar focused. We had to go through the entire elementary book to prepare them. So we did ground all of our activities within a cultural context. Um, in fact, there was a simulation in that course in which the students were playing the roles of um, journalists for the Guy du Tao, which is a, which is a, um, uh, a guidebook for France. So in any case, it was grounded within cultural context. However, we did have to. Our objectives were grounded within grammar many times. So, in any case, uh, at the end of they felt uh, at the end of French 121 they felt most competent in the following culture items. So, I can provide information about French lodging and housing. I can provide information about cuisine. I can research and plan and participate in a cultural event, etc. So, and these actually if I think about it were very closely tied with what we were doing in the class. Um, they felt least confident in the following cultural items, all associated with cultural perspectives. So I can recognize how products and practices reflect the viewpoints of people in French-speaking countries. I'm familiar with the role of contemporary and historical events in French Francophone culture. Um, so what we found, and what if I reflected on the course again, cultural perspectives did not play a key role. And now the question was, after that, was how could we enhance that? Should we? Do we need to? Can that happen later? Can that be focused on the intermediate level? Or should we integrate this more? So these, all, these were all questions that came about when we found this information. So here, um, questions. Do we need to place a greater emphasis on cultural perspectives? Um, do we need to include objectives within the syllabus linked to cultural understanding and cultural perspectives? And how can we enhance that? Um, these were all things that came up. So what's interesting about this is Heidi Burns talked about how can departments know if their students attain learning outcomes and to what extent. Well, self-efficacy does not provide you with exact information about whether or not they've attained your learning outcomes. However, we know whether or not they perceive themselves as capable of attaining those learning outcomes. And also, as we know that self-efficacy is closely linked with achievement, 
we can have some level of understanding of what's happening in our curriculum. So results from these questionnaires can be evaluated by the coordinators, it can be evaluated by the director of language programs, it can be evaluated by teachers, it can be done on a global level, it can be done on an instructor level, it can be easily adapted. I have all of these questionnaires on my website. They can easily be adapted and used by other languages. Um, they and then the information that you have here can provide value information and also maintain the importance of the language requirement to future students, the department, and the administration. I could imagine putting some of these graphs on a website um, for the department or providing this to the administration if there are questions about how what's happening within your department. Um, what are students capable or perceive themselves capable of doing at the end? Uh, their experience in the language requirement, especially with what's happening with all of the um, budget restrictions these days. So that's a second study, another example um, of how self-efficacy can be used in the foreign language classroom. And now, if we want to shift a little bit, how can we further explore the self-efficacy beliefs of foreign language teachers? Um, I found this to be a very interesting um, realm of research. So I'm going to talk about a study called Teaching Assistant Self-Efficacy in Teaching Literature, Sources, Personal Assessments, and Consequences. This is a study from 2011 in the Modern Language Journal. So teacher self-efficacy refers to teachers' judgments of their capabilities to bring about desired outcomes related to student learning and engagement. So how competent do they feel in their ability to um, teach the particular task? that they're assigned to teach. So what I was interested in, so um, this was um, a study in which I was interested in learning more about graduate students of French that are graduate students of French literature who are often asked to teach lower level courses as part of their requirement. So what's been talked about a lot, especially with the MLA report, is this sort of two-tiered system, language at the lower levels, literature at the higher levels. So my interest was, well, how does this influence the professionalization and socialization of graduate students? Do they perceive literary study and instruction as distinctly different from language pedagogy? How do they perceive themselves as teachers of literature? Well, how do they perceive their competency as language versus literature? So we have these sort of um, two labels. And what are the sources and consequences of these things? So to give you a general overview, this is a teacher self-efficacy model um, from Shannon Moran, Wolf Akoy, and Hoy. And to give you an idea of how it works in a cycle, this model I think provides a nice framework. So starting with the sources that we talked about earlier, mastery experiences, verbal, vicarious, um, physical, physiological arousal as emotional indicators. Um, same for teachers. So what this, the, student, the teachers do is they cognitively process these sources. Then they analyze the teaching task. So hey, what am I teaching? What lesson am I teaching right now? And how competent do I feel my ability to teach this particular lesson? Then that forms their teacher self-efficacy, how competent they feel in their ability to teach. And then there are some consequences that arise. Their goals, how much effort they place, their persistence when things get difficult. And then that has a link to their performance, which then provides new sources of self-efficacy, and the cycle then continues. So developing a qualitative questionnaire based on this model, I asked in teachers questions. Um, and I'm going to show you those questions. So basically, there were 10 participants <coughs> enrolled in the doctoral program in French literature. And they were, had an interview with me. In addition to, they completed a teacher self-efficacy in literature questionnaire. Um, so just a basic general question. How do you know how to teach literature? Well, they said, observations of literature professors, model professors, and anti-models, knowledge of language pedagogy only, trial and error, experiences as a literature student, and common sense. So um, then our next question was, how have you had successful experiences in teaching literature? And they said, this was very interesting because this dichotomy ran throughout most of the interviews. They said they've taught text in language classes, but they haven't taught literature. 
They taught texts at the intermediate level, and this is another dichotomy, is that texts, which were not literature, which is a very important distinction, which I found interesting. So the texts, within the text, they focused on comprehension, but they did not focus on analysis. Analysis only happened when they were teaching literature, which was only happening at the advanced level. So this was sort of the, this was the language that was being used to describe, and it was very, very telling and very interesting for me as a coordinator, um, which impacted a lot how I work with my TAs now. Um, also, no opportunity to teach literature, experience teaching literature at high school or as a TA. Taught text at the elementary level. Have you had feedback from others about your teaching of literature? Now this goes back again to that source, verbal feedback. No, only for teaching language. Very little, and only two said that they had yes. They said yes, they had. Um, so again, another source not cultivated, or perceived to be not cultivated from the interviews. Vicarious experiences. Are you influenced by other professors in your teaching of literature? They all said yes. What was very interesting about this was that they provided me with general frameworks, like general comments, like I observe how they present content. I observe how they formulate guiding questions. And then when I started to ask and probe a bit, I said, well, how do they present content? All of a sudden, they were not able to answer my question. How do they formulate guiding questions? They weren't able to answer my question. How do they give feedback? How do these teachers give feedback? They couldn't provide me with any details. Uh, so that was, that was an interesting finding as well. And then for... Uh, and then finally, emotional indicators. How do you feel while you're teaching literature? Unsure. They said they feel like they they're less confident. They they feel like they're going to they're they're going to 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 feel great, but they don't feel like they've had the experience because they've only taught texts and texts aren't literature. Um, so and this was sort of a, a quote from the interview. So it's hard to say just because I've had a lot more experience with the language side, so I have a lot more data points, you know, in my memory. In terms of how I feel about teaching literature versus language, I think I would feel a lot less secure, but you know, in reality, I think all the graduates just kind of feel like, how are we? You know, we'll do it because you overcome, always overcome your difficulties. So then we kind of worked again using that framework, how well do you feel that you teach literature? They said they felt less confident in their ability to teach literature, although they project that they will feel confident in the future. And that <clears throat> this notion that I feel that I gave gain an important skill set in my teaching of lower level courses, but it's just, there's just, it's not a direct line from teaching language to teaching literature. So, um, and then I asked a variety of questions about how we could maybe support these issues within the doctoral program and providing graduate students with experience teaching literature, experience as a TA, focus half the pedagogy course on the teaching of literature, increase feedback from literature faculty on literature skills development. So these were all ideas that they had. <laughs> in terms of the consequences of teacher self-efficacy, I said, hey, so would you implement innovative or experimental strategies in teaching literature? And they said, absolutely. And so which ones? And they said, I, I don't know. Um, so so what, 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 what came about from this interview and what came about from the data was that, to be honest, when I looked at the quantitative form, they possessed a moderate level of teacher self-efficacy in literature. So it really it was 6.8 out of 9. I had not used the 100 scale for this study. But what I found was that three of the four sources of teacher self-efficacy were not fostered. They found more competent teaching elementary and intermediate level courses and advanced level literature courses, and they found that the graduate program was highly effective in its formation of literary scholars and language instructors, but literature instruction is perceived as a gap between these two holes. And what I found was that um, what, what we're finding is that there's, these TAs are being trained by, <clears throat> by quote-unquote language faculty, 
and they're being uh, to teach and they're being professionalized um, in terms of their scholarly work by literature faculty, quote unquote, and um, we're creating the sort of product <laughs> of our environment. Um, so this changed a lot for me um, in terms of how I addressed the discussion of text when I work with teaching assistants and new instructors. But basically what we found in analyzing this a bit is that they had their pedagogical knowledge, they had their content knowledge, right? But what they were missing was this pedagogical content knowledge, this joining of the two together. Um, and they were missing a very valuable, valuable piece um, or they perceived that they were missing this valuable piece. So, just giving you a few examples. Now, just, just want to talk about how maybe this research could link to the teaching of less commonly taught languages. Um, so what I did was I kind of looked at some of the research that's available that, I, that associated with less commonly taught languages and some of the questions that had come up. And these were some of the questions and then questions that I had associated with it. So less commonly taught language classes typically consist of, according to Bendish and Scholl, heritage learners, non-heritage language learners, and students with heritage language motivation, meaning they have little or no fluency in the heritage language but cultural background. Um, so a question could be, um, how do the self-efficacy beliefs of these three groups differ in the areas of communication, culture, connections, communities, and comparison? Maybe that's a question that could be interesting. I don't know. What are the self-advocacy beliefs of heritage versus non-heritage language learners and their cap capabilities to use standard versus non-standardized varieties of language? Um, how does an instructor's choice of standard versus non-standardized language of a, varieties of a language influence students' self-advocacy beliefs? And maybe you could look at, again, looking at heritage versus non-heritage learners. Stenson and Al in 1998 talked about how learning about a culture has been identified as a key motivating factor for less commonly taught language students. So what are less commonly taught language students' self-advocacy beliefs and cultural understandings in products, practice, perspectives in a given curriculum? Um, what are the, the, the teacher self-advocacy beliefs in terms of their ability to effectively teach cultural products, practices, and perspectives? Um, students also, according to Murphy Magnin back in Brett Rux in 2009, talked about, they talked about how students study less commonly taught languages for both humanistic reasons, so maybe personal enjoyment, interest, and also utilitarian interests, improving career prospects. So maybe how do the self-advocacy beliefs of these two diff groups differ? How are they similar? Do our curricular plans meet their needs? Um, that's another question. Friedman in 2004 talked about how language enrollment in less commonly taught language courses is steady in the first and second year and then sort of drops off at the higher level of studies. We see that in most languages actually. But how do self-efficacy beliefs evolve from the beginning of the, uh, of the first year to the end of the second year? Another question that you could also think about potentially is not linked to self-efficacy but a question that I had um, with my longitudinal study which was their perceived value of learning particular things. So what would student interviews tell us about their perceived competence, but also about their perceived value of learning a less commonly taught language at the advanced level? So what do they perceive as valuable to learn? And what do they perceive as less valuable to learn? How that, might, that information might enhance your curriculum uh, or changes in your curriculum potentially. What do students deem important and valuable, and how could this be integrated? So that was my same question. Um, another question. Uh, Wang in 2009 discussed a need for increased solidarity, availability of updated teaching materials, and collaboration among less commonly taught language instructors. So um, do their teacher self-efficacy beliefs evolve and develop from the beginning to the ending, beginning to the end of a teacher training workshop or course? I talked to you previously about the Star Talk. Persian program is involved with, where we evaluated teacher self-efficacy beliefs in curriculum development at the beginning and at the end. What are the teacher self-efficacy beliefs of 
uh, less commonly taught language instructors as they relate to the development of teaching materials that align with current communicative, post-communicative, and literacy-based teaching methodologies, and maybe where do they feel most competent, where do they feel least competent, and then how could those areas be tapped at in a teacher training program. Um, what is the collective efficacy of less commonly taught language instructors? So collective efficacy is the perceived confidence of the group as opposed to the individual. Um, Haley and Farrow in 2011 suggest that U.S. teacher language teacher programs are typically geared toward instruction of commonly taught languages and emphasize constructivist paradigms. So how do teacher training programs that influence how do they influence the teacher self-efficacy beliefs of these instructors from different cultural backgrounds with different educational paradigms? Right? Um, what are the teacher self-efficacy beliefs of less commonly taught versus commonly taught language instructors that are enrolled in U.S. teacher education programs that focus largely on commonly taught languages? Where and how do they differ and how could teacher education programs revise their program curricula accordingly so that they are not um, focusing so directly on Spanish instruction, et cetera, English instruction. So those are just some questions I had, and I'm sure you would have a lot more ideas than me, <laughs> um, but just some food for thought. Um, and the last, the last thing I wanted to just touch on is how do I foster self-efficacy in the less commonly taught language classroom? What can I do? Um, so, well, um, you want to provide a lot of opportunity for students to exercise control of their own learning, to problem solve, to set goals, and you want to give the opportunity to create a collaborative classroom where there's shared knowledge, there's shared decision making. You want to foster master experiences, so you want to provide opportunities for the students to experience, to experience success. So that means that you want to have a lot of really solid, really good teacher-guided activities with appropriate scaffolding so that you prepare your students to be successful so when they actually do engage in the activity that they're successful. Um, you want to provide them with multiple opportunities to exchange information, discuss opinions, and present their ideas with their peers and partners. So a lot of partner practice, a lot of small group practice before they're asked to participate during a large group. Um, and a lot of modeling of effective language learning strategies. Um, same thing, fostering vicarious experiences, going back to that modeling, a lot of in-class presentation, um, model text, model essays written by native speakers or even written by successful former students. It's very helpful for students to see what their colleagues have done. Um, student observation of linguistically proficient peers. This really inspires um, students and their perception of how, how they can, uh, their potential, and how well they can do in the future. Maybe students who have studied abroad or at the advanced level, they could visit your classroom, the lower levels. Um, again, models of former student work. Collaborative learning experiences where they're able to work together and they're able to observe their successes of peers at the similar proficiency levels as well. I skip something. Um, well, okay. What causes anxiety according to foreign language students? So we want to foster and encourage positive emotions as opposed to negative, right? So what causes anxiety? Non-comprehension. They don't understand. It's over their head, right? So the language level, level that you've chosen, the text that you've chosen is beyond what they're capable of comprehending. That's going to cause anxiety. Excessive error correction. Any error that's spoken in the classroom has to be connect corrected. That's something that I think teachers feel and is absolutely not the case. It depends on the context. Um, fear of peer and teacher evaluation. So it's that idea of non-debilitating feedback. The speed of the course, these intimidating teachers. Um, comparison to native speaker performance. This idea that, you know, these students are not native speakers and they never will be, and that's okay. Um, So you want to develop a sense of community, a personal relationship, but yet you're still the teacher, right? So you want to have some sort of level of um, a relationship with the students. And then these, these are this is all from a study on students and what students said. So teachers who make the 
class fun to like learning, make the class more animated, make it interesting by using interesting situations grounded in engaging cultural content. Um, also, teacher repetition, reinforcement, using appealing and relevant topics, freedom choice, experimentations, so all of these things we've talked about before. And then finally, well, Obama, he ran on this campaign, and I just it just fits so well with what collective efficacy is. So, yes, we can is exactly the notion of collective efficacy. Um, so, uh, fostering the self-efficacy, the sources of self-efficacy, really helped to establish a community of learners and a classroom dynamic in which learners create an, a shared sense of collective efficacy. And in your classroom, you, want, you're, you really want to aim and hope that your students are going to have this perceived ability that they can, can complete these tasks and they can com communicate effectively in the target language. And so that, yes, we can. Um, and then fostering, enhancing, and assessing self-efficacy, yes we can, I hope we all can, or have some ideas, or have the beginning to start thinking about it, and yes, you can, I think you can, I hope, and if you have any question, you can ask me anytime. Um, I have online a reference list available, I have a new upcoming chapter that is a, provides a nice overview if you're interested. Um, it's called Self-Efficacy and Second Language Acquisition. That's coming out soon. It's under review, but it should be out within six months to a year. Um, my email is there, and then uh, my website there also has some of these articles I've talked about, as well as some of the surveys and instruments that I used. Um, and if you're interested in looking at those and adapting them to your context, um, could be something of interest as well. So thank you very much. Thank you, thank you Nicole. Um, we, we really, really appreciate this um, sweep, sweeping overview. This is this is really great to get this. And, and we're looking forward to taking questions both both from those here, uh, those uh, who, who are watching from far, from afar. Uh, Apologies for some of the technical challenges some of you have have, uh, have encountered, but uh, uh, this the, the presentation will be available on our website um, nmelrc.org. And uh, so let's go ahead and and uh, and please start sending us in your your, your questions. I, I would just like to just say in, in sort of in opening up the question, uh, a, a brief comment. Uh, when we talked about doing this, um, I I was. Uh, really, really pleased to see uh, uh, Nicole's willingness to tackle this from both the perspective of the, the teacher and what we can do to construct an environment that will promote self-efficacy, but also as well, um, I want, and I've invited, we have a number of, of, of students sitting around the table here with us uh, today, um, and uh, I'm very interested in what students can do to, when, we don't always have a teacher who understands promoting self-efficacy. In fact, uh, all of us can think of teachers who seem to specialize in how to uh, destroy self-efficacy, um, and and sort of thought that that was you know that that, that was for uh, and many of them meant well. That they they, they 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 come from a cultural background or or family or whatever background that predisposes them to to believe that um, that you. That you know, this that language learning is 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 tough stuff, um, and um, and it's you know it's it's good for you. In fact, I was just listening to an author talking on a radio interview yesterday, whose whose father every day at the dinner table uh, would at, would would say would would ask a question about current events, uh, something in the current events, and then would say, after the after the his his sons responded, he would say, I don't understand, and. His design was to prompt them to be more articulate, right, in what they were saying. But for this, for this particular son, it was it really made him doubt himself and his ability to to communicate. Of course, he he did go on to become a, 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 an award-winning author. So, uh, <laughs> so in the end, I suppose perhaps father did know best. Uh, I don't know, uh, but uh, but I think we need to take that into into account. We just finished a, 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 a step, well, we're in the middle of, of uh, we finished gathering uh, data in, in, uh, from
from a group of study abroad students, 52 students of Arabic in, in uh, an uh, intensive uh, advanced level study abroad course. And interesting to me was we asked them what were the most important factors in your success in helping you to, to persevere. This was about project perseverance. What, what helped you press forward, press on? And the number one factor that they reported was encouragement from their teachers. Uh, a number of people will point out that, that encouragement that is not deserved uh, will undermine the process. But if you get well-deserved encouragement, uh, appropriately expressed, powerful stuff. So with that, I'm, I'm going to leave it or open it up for, for questions. And, and thank you so much again. We're, oh, we're no, excited to continue the conversation. <laughs> We have one question in the chat room. All right, I'll go ahead and I'll go ahead and uh, and 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 uh, I'm just going to sit here and, and and you can take a look here at uh, at our questions. So which which one were you referring to, this, Scott? This, I think this one right here. I'm teaching Arabic. Is that what you're talking about, Scott? Yeah. So it says here I'm teaching Arabic, and students think that this language is not important and say they are not interested in it at all. Boy, I don't know where you are because I, I have not met. The, I, that's that's very sad to hear, and I don't know where. I, uh, how can I deal with this? I'm I'm in a very low socioeconomic school, and most students don't even know how to write proper English. Uh, well, I would love to hear a little bit more, uh, Tarek. So uh, if you could if you could send in a little bit more about where you are, uh, that would be great. And and Nicole, please. Well, I think I think um, one of the one one of the really important important things when you're teaching a language and something that I noted in the research associated with less commonly taught languages is that the emphasis that students would really like to have on cultural learning. So in addition to learning about the language itself and the structure and the grammar, etc., and functions, of, um, they also are very interested in learning more about the culture. So if you could figure out a way to connect to your students, um, introducing content or topics that link to their lives, whether it be a social media site, um, that they can look at a Facebook page where students are interacting, asking questions and answers. That might then motivate them about, maybe it's a film clip um, about young people um, living in uh, a particular target culture. Um, something that you can have them connect with that then you can maybe then spin off into the discussion of the formation of the past tense and narration, um, which maybe they might not be as excited to learn about. Um, but you could get them excited to learn about it if after they watch this film clip, then they have to learn about how to use the past tense and the structure of the past tense to then recount what happened in the film clip to someone on a social media site. That might then sort of spark their motivation a bit. I don't know, just a thought. So Rick, Rick uh, sorry, Tark writes, uh, it's a high school and students feel they're forced to learn Arabic. This is a big, this is a huge factor. Mm -hmm. They don't have interest. How can I help them be more interested? Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm curious to know how many of them are heritage, are, are heritage learners. Um, I've, I've seen this kind of thing with, uh, with, with, her with, with heritage learners who are sort of pressed into, into this. But uh, that's uh, uh, one of the things that I was just thinking about here was it, in helping them, you know, people like this. I'm curious to know your responses. Mm -hmm. Role models, so where they see, where, where they see, you know, what what Arabic has done for other students who have who have done. That might be one way to reach a group like this. What, what's your? Oh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, if you could bring in somebody that had studied Arabic at that particular high school and then went to college and then used Arabic to then develop a club or to develop. Uh, some sort of professional goals that he or she had and to invite that person in to talk about how this relates to their lives and to the world in general. Um, newspaper articles, if that interests them. Um, how this links outside of the classroom to the community within which they live and then beyond the community within which they live and the country which they live. Um, just taking it out of um, the teaching of just the structures, because I don't think that sometimes that can be as motivating as if it's left out of the context of the culture. Uh, yes, and, and, and Tara did come back saying about half of them are, are, ter are heritage learners. Let's take another question. Uh, for, how about uh, someone, someone here? Anybody have a question that they would like to uh, uh, 
Yeah, please. This is from doc, Dr. Bown. As I'm interested in the difference, in the gender difference in mm -hmm. seeing self-efficacy, and I wonder, I have heard research that generally women do tend to underestimate their abilities, whereas men tend to overestimate their abilities. <laughs> is this well, well, in, that's actually <laughs> that is there is truth to that. Um, in general, we're going to find that if we have a large scale study, three hundred plus thousand students, we're going to see that in general, self efficacy beliefs are fairly uh, right on in terms of the achievement and performance. However, if we start to look at it a little bit more closely, um, women are actually more accurate in their self-efficacy beliefs, and men sometimes tend to inflate slightly their self-efficacy beliefs. Um, so we think that that could have been a reason why we might have seen that the mean change was not as different, because we saw that the men at the beginning found themselves more competent, but they didn't change throughout the <laughs> as much. But there was not a mean difference in the average self-efficacy at the end of the language program, but there was a difference in the mean change. So it's possible that the men might have overestimated at the beginning and then came back a little bit. So it, it's a very interesting point, but it's, a, it's an important one because we see that we do have, well, I know that we do in French and Spanish often, is we do have a lot more language um, majors and minors that are women. So how is self-advocacy playing a role in that? Um, and what can we do to, to, to figure out, whether it be through interviews, um, through further analysis, what's happening? What are the men thinking? Um, what do they perceive in their experience in the language classroom? Or what do they not perceive? And how, how can we tap at that in terms of curriculum development? We've got a question here from uh, Dr. Jeremy Brown, who has uh, wrote his uh, dissertation on uh, dealing with self-efficacy. A while ago. And I, I just wanted to, to piggyback on this question. And I wonder if some of that difference observed in the gains between genders <laughs> isn't in part due to the constructs of, of measure here that, um, you know, uh, female students tend to prefer writing more than the male students do. Um, I, there, there are dissertations out there that show that um, in literature that children are reading coming from high school, the women in the literature are writing, the men are not. They don't see the examples as much and so forth. So, I, I mean, I'm, I don't think that it accounts for all of the difference, but you know, given the difference, or given the, that it was a writing as opposed to a speaking or a cultural competence. Well, well, that's, well, what was interesting with the findings that I found within the language requirement was that it wasn't within the communication standard that there was a difference between men and women. It was within culture, connections, communities, and comparison, but not communication. But all that was under the umbrella of writing? No, no, no. no. So writing wasn't, in terms of writing, there were no gender differences in my study. Now, certainly, there might be something different in another study. In this, it was more within the cultural products, practices, perspectives, their perceived understanding of them, um, their ability to compare um, their own language to the target language and to the target culture. So those are the areas where we found that there was a stark mean change differences in self-efficacy. Again, you know, with a different group, you might have found different, different findings. I have a question. Um, in your longitudinal study, mm -hmm. I'm wondering if the, the questions that they were asked changed for each level and they were based on what they should know at that level or if it were the, if it was the same questions throughout the study it was the same questions repeated throughout the study so it was a I, I, I don't have the exact number of items on there but there were over a hundred items in self-efficacy and they ranged from simple tasks from I can say hello and goodbye to I can engage actively in a debate so so those sort of they, they ranged um, so you would really worry if that didn't go up along the scale, because they're supposed to know more by the end, right? Exactly. Okay. So, but but you know, if we see that it's sort of flatlining somewhere, that could that can also show us something interesting. You know, why is this flatlining, and why are they not you know feeling more competent from the beginning of 
intermediate one to the end of intermediate two in this particular targeted area. And yet we would be worried. <laughs> we would say, okay, we need to work on this. And cultural perspectives was one that definitely um, enhanced and developed in the intermediate level, but in the beginning levels was flatlining. So we uh, that's something that we need to think about more. Other questions here? I, I have one if nobody else has one, right? A burning well, Mark, please. In your presentation, there's a slide referring to anxiety in language learning according to foreign language students. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if there's any uh, source of anxiety that you perceive that the students are missing out on. Maybe they're not, they're not admitting themselves, or ones that the teachers have told you are sources of anxiety. Uh, besides the one that I listed, yeah, those on are there? ones the, the students said when the, that students gave them themselves. Is these is what's causing us anxiety? Are there things that you think that they didn't admit, or things that actually are? Oh, I'm anxiety? sure that the, it's. I'm sure. I, I think that anxiety. Those are sort of generalized areas of what can cause anxiety among students and what has been researched. But I think anxiety is also very personal. Um, so I think it's also very individualized. So di different types of students might experience anxiety for different reasons. Um, but what was it really interesting with, within the construct of self-efficacy is that anxiety, now language anxiety is, is something that's been widely researched. Um, with, within self-efficacy, anxiety is a source of self-efficacy, right? So in the sec one, my, within um, one of my studies, I evaluated the relationship between self-efficacy and anxiety. So which one predicted achievement? proficiency over and above the other. So if anxiety is the source of self-efficacy, you would imagine that self-efficacy and not anxiety would predict, predict proficiency. And in fact, that's found in almost all areas of academic, all other academic domains. What I found in my particular study was that reading self-efficacy predicted reading proficiency over and above anxiety. But within listening, Listening anxiety predicted listening proficiency over and above self-efficacy, which I found troubling, and I still am not convinced of it. I think I have to redo that study. Um, but ne negative correlation, like listening anxiety. Yeah, okay. exactly. Excuse yeah. me. Yeah, listening anxiety was negatively correlated with um, with achievement, and I would have predicted that self-efficacy would have predicted um, achievement over and above that. That wasn't the case, and again, I'm still that's still up for debate in my book. But um, I think it might have been the the, the the construct that I was using at the time. Well, it, we we had a, a webinar here last year with uh, Madeline Ehrman, and and one of the po points that Madeline makes is that anxiety eats cognition, and, and that's a, <laughs> <laughs> that's powerful stuff. Uh, we've got a question here from uh, one of our uh, offsite viewers. Let me read. Let me read it. Uh, uh, she, she says, I have a question about the survey as well. First, 125 seems like a lot of questions. <laughs> Were students okay with answering that many and multiple times? <laughs> also, I, I relate this because we, we're, we're really bad at asking uh, large surveys. Also, I wonder if students fo uh, felt deflated at the beginning, beginning oh, when no. they reported such low levels of ability. No. Um, no, in fact, the students were, were actually really excited to see the results. Um, so that's something that I found from the beginning to the end of the semester. They were really interested in seeing um, how competent they felt at the beginning and how competent they felt at the end of the study, and they actually celebrated that. Um, in terms of <laughs> 125 questions was a lot of questions, and it was a lot of questions for us too to, to yeah. enter. Um, if I were to do it again, I would do it online with an online survey. Um, also, in terms of them feeling okay, they signed a form at the beginning of the semester, uh, informed consent form, and it didn't take that long. You know, once you start going through, you just go through pretty quickly. Um, and it probably took them, I don't know, 20 minutes. I think we did it one class period, 20, 20 25 minutes at the beginning of the semester and then at the end. We provided them with the data. And I think they were happy to see it. Um, so, I, I, let me add a comment from a viewer uh, that ties into that, who, who said, I, "I think linguafolio is a is a wonderful way to promote metacognition and self-efficacy." Mm -hmm. And and we found that well-constructed questions were really useful for students to reflect on their Absolutely. practice. 
And, mm -hmm. and so, the, you know, it, it is time consuming, but it's also educational. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And then they might say, oh, wow, yeah, I'm not, I, I don't feel as competent in that particular task. And sometimes that could lead that particular student to work a little bit harder on that um, at home. So. And that's, I want to follow up on that and ask about promoting uh, uh, one of the points that you, you, you talked you talk about is this meta, is metacognition and, and, mm -hmm. and, and so forth. To, to what degree are you certainly m modeling strategies is great stuff, mm -hmm. but to what degree do you get back to the abstract level? Do, do, do you talk, for example, with students about self-efficacy? To what degree is, is, is the consciousness raising of the, of the very construct Useful, you know, and right. I, um, I'm very interested. Well, I like. I was working with someone um, on campus, and and he helped me develop an online self-efficacy survey that the students can complete at the beginning, at the end of the beginning one and beginning two courses. So something that I want to try to work on and continue. So that's one aspect of how I might want to promote it. But typically, really, to be honest, how I promote it mostly is through encouragement because and through appropriate feedback and a lot of feedback um, and feedback that's not only um, constructive but also positive uh, and really working with them through that and telling them when they've done a great job, telling them when they've improved, telling them where they've improved, tell them that I notice that they've improved. Um, I also do a lot of modeling, a lot of guidance. I want them to succeed in the classroom and I want to create a classroom where they feel really comfortable and, and where we've created a community where everyone feels this collective feeling of like, hey, we can do this. And if they feel like they can, I can step in and say, yes, you can. <laughs> yes, we can, like yes. Obama. Um, you know, so I try to do it more so through modeling. I know that some instructors do it by asking them to reflect on the end of the year um, a self-assessment. Where do you feel that you're at right now? Some students feel that that can be busy work. So I sometimes try to ask them at, at the end of the final oral exam. I talk about that with them. This is what I see. This is where I see you develop. This is where I see where you can continue to develop. How do you perceive it? How do you feel? Um, and then we can talk about that then. So that's how personally I do it. I think there's a lot of different ways to tap out of that. Thank you very much. We do have a couple that aren't able to connect on the chat room. And they've sent some questions via email. OK. OK. Uh, this is from Zainab. Uh, she says, good afternoon. We watched the whole webinar. We would like to participate. Oh, sorry. Uh, oh, sorry. This is not the right question. Uh, sorry. Actually, Laura, uh, Laura Abby would like to say thank you uh, for the webinar and uh, was curious. Sorry, there's no question. <laughs> hey, what, why don't you fi um... I guess they decided not. They sent the emails. All right. So you, if, if you want to forward the e emails to me, then uh, okay. then we can take a look at them. Because we have another question right here. Um, so we have from going back to the methods used to study self-efficacy in teachers and learners, how do we determine what survey respondents have the same perception and understanding of the skills we are asking about that the researchers do? Likewise, what do you think might the impact of asking these questions and thus making your objectives for them more explicit? Oh, I think yeah. that's an excellent Excellent. I think that's excellent. Uh, that's an excellent part of, of having these objectives set out. Um, you can ask a self-efficacy, you can have a self-efficacy survey that taps at the objectives that you have for the year, and then you can have them answer those questions in their perception. So right off the bat, they know what they're going to be learning or hopefully learning by the end of the semester. You as a teacher, I think it's really, really effective because right at the beginning of the semester, you know, because you know, you don't always know who's in your classroom and where they're at and what their background is and what their experiences are. So right at the beginning of the semester, you can look at this and say, okay, I can see who my group is now. I have a, I have a better understanding of who they are just beyond their name and where they're from, and et cetera, what classes they've taken. Um, so it's, a great, it's great for you, and it's great for the, the students as well, I think, too, because they can also reflect on those objectives um, and where they're at and where they could potentially be. Thank you. Anyone else are sitting around the table here? 
Yeah, this is kind of a simple question, but you mentioned how um, anxiety is the source of mm -hmm. self-efficacy. Mm -hmm. One like, of them. Or one of them. Like, could you expand on what you mean by that? Well, so we talked about how, well, and it's a cycle, right? So remember how I pulled up that one, and when we looked at teacher self-efficacy, we talked about how there's a cycle. So you have these sources, you have successful experiences, people give you feedback, you process that, mm -hmm. you are doing a particular task, you feel anxious or you feel really great, you feel really positive, that's going to then process, you're going to cognitively process that, and then that's going to link to how confident you feel in your ability to do something or not. So anxiety, the experience of anxiety while you are doing a particular reading task, for example, in the foreign language, that feeling is going to typically negatively correlate with how you process, you're going to process that feeling and then that's going to link to typically a negative self-efficacy. Now if you feel really great, you feel really positive, wow, I feel really, I feel energized, I feel happy while I'm doing this. That's, you're going to cognitively process that feeling, and then that's typically going to link to a higher sense of self-efficacy and your capability to do that task. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. Okay. But then it, I mean, then it cycles around again. Yep. Please. So going back to just the gender differences mm -hmm. with self-efficacy, do you find that there are like larger or smaller disparities depending on the language, or have you just looked at French? Like, are there different? Oh, in terms of the language, if you were to look at different languages, I, I, I there's certainly possibilities. There's a lot of self been a lot of self efficacy in French. Um, I know Graham also did French as well, which is unfortunate. Um, but, uh, but there, are, but. There, there, there certainly could be, and I think that there is absolutely different self-efficacy wow. beliefs according to culture. Okay. Um, I think depending on your cultural context, um, they are going to see differences in your evaluation and your perception of your capabilities and how you report that. So. I'm, I'm very interested to come back to this question of uh, this matter of uh, Cultivating meta, the metacognitive, um, mm -hmm. and uh, and to what degree? Uh, more thoughts on how, how to that you might have, like to share with us. That, that this is Dr. Ehrman and I were, were were sitting the other day at a. Um, I mean, it's been it's been a couple of months, but we were sitting down after a presentation and basically came down came you know came to the conclusion said it really does come down to self awareness. This huge mm -hmm. amount of especially being self a self-regulating learner. And if you happen to have the, the wonderful benefit of landing in a class where you have a very nurturing teacher who, who instills self-confidence in you and, and sort of helps you, points, you, points the way and so mm -hmm. forth, uh, that's great. But, but a, a lot of students don't have that, that opportunity. And so if they are going to succeed in, in achieving their language goals, they have to become really, really good self-regulators. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm, I'm very much interested in hearing more of what you would say to that. What, do, what does a student do, and, and, and how do we as faculty help them to develop that so that so that they can be lifelong learners? Uh, absolutely. And in fact, um, one of my the, the first the first study that I referenced on the the reference list that I put out um, that study evaluated a wide variety of different motivational variables. One of them being self-efficacy and self-regulation. So self-efficacy and self-regulation is your perceived ability to self-regulate, meaning your perceived ability to organize your time, get yourself together, to study ahead of time, do your homework, all that stuff. So that was one of the, the, the constructs that was measured. What was found within that study was that self-efficacy for self-regulation predicted academic achievement above self-efficacy. So, students' perceived ability to, to study progressively, to do their homework every night, to you know, write out everything they need to write out, to study and do all these things, that actually predicted their success in that class above and beyond self-efficacy. Therefore, that's a very interesting question, then how can we work in the classroom to promote self-regulation skills? and perceived ability to self-regulate, whether that be, you know, I have a handout actually that I use in my class where I collected 
I touched base with all of the beginning students that that my teachers, my instructors said were really successful. And I wrote to them and I reached out and I said, hey, what do you do? <laughs> Tell me how you study. And I was amazed to get a wide variety of really interesting, complex <laughs> ways in which they studied. I was actually very, very interested by it. But what I did was I compiled all that and I put it together and I made a handout. And it was reading, you know, grammar, different, different, different approaches that they had to studying. And I handed it out to my students. I said, okay, these are some things that your colleagues do. Now, especially with the beginning language course, some students have maybe had limited language exposure, uh, language learning exposure. So I said, hey, this is what this is different from other things that you're studying. This is what they do. Maybe this is something that you might want to think about. And also, why don't you? this isn't necessarily going to apply to you because everyone's a little bit different. So why don't you reflect on maybe how you study um, and whether or not this is effective for you. And sometimes I have to pull in students who are struggling and frustrated and like, why can't I do well on this quiz? And we sit down and we talk about it. Um, what are you doing? Maybe what are you not doing? Let's look at this list. What could you try out? Try out something that's a little bit different than what you're used to. You could also look at research-based uh, examples of good self-regulatory strategies of foreign language learning. Um, but that metacognitive thought process of what am I doing to study <laughs> is something students don't always think about. They just say, okay, I'm studying now, and but they don't necessarily think about what or how they're doing it. No. It could be a discussion you have with them. It is, is regulation of emotion also part of that uh, uh, predictor of academic success? That, you know, that Factors in because that's another big one is can you can you recognize discouragement and deal with it? You know? Yeah, well, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, and that's associated with self-efficacy as well. If you're able to sort of overcome those mm -hmm. obstacles, mm -hmm. um, and when things get a little tough, you're able to move beyond it. And if you have a lot of success, mastery experiences, successful experiences doing that task are actually the largest predictor, one of the biggest sources of self-efficacy, above and beyond all of the other three. So if you have a bank of successful experiences behind you, you're more apt to say, OK, I know this is hard right now, but I'm going to get through it. You know, I can do this. Um, we have a question here coming in from email. Let me say this is, uh, hello all, I'm Hanan Halus. I would like to uh, share that I have found this webinar to be very valuable as an Arabic teacher for grades K through second. Uh, Self-efficacy plays a big role in how students learn the learn language since there are many factors that contribute to the success of language learning. One of the most important factors that I come to every day in my teaching is the student's attitude toward the learning process and how I present the lesson. Also the emotional factor is very important. Many students are very shy to speak out and I find it hard, hard to make them participate no matter how hard I try to encourage them to speak out. Mm -hmm. Any suggestions? So these are small children. Yeah. Great. Would yeah. Love no. To see well, these. yeah. No. I mean, the more. I mean, I don't have small children. Small children. I don't have small children in my class, but I have beginning language learners, probably at the same language level <laughs> at the beginning of the semester. Anyway, um, I always put them in partners. Always. So they kind of laugh at me sometimes because they say, you know, in groups, in partners again, and like, okay, again, you know, before I ask any question to a large group discussion. I always have them talk about it in partners first. They feel a sense of um, encouragement knowing that their peer next to them agrees with them, or maybe they have the same answer, or maybe they have a different answer. They can kind of confirm or not, con con not confirm. So if you more pair work, the more activities you do to put them together, it's so much better. I always, I tell all of my instructors that too, I have at least seven pair work activities per class, even if it's for just two minutes. Um, and it just helps you move through the material. It helps them feel more confident. When It's scary to speak in a target language when you don't know it very well, especially as a beginning language learner. I imagine as a child, too, it sounds different. It's different for you. Um, you want to make them feel as comfortable as possible. So I find that that has been the most effective technique for me. Speaking specifically about shy students, we have a, a mm. significant challenge with students. Um, uh, this this is not this is us as a profession. Uh, for example, when we get students out into not just in the classroom, but out into a into an in country environment uh, where 
foreign language anxiety is 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 high, and um, and 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 it's surprising how widespread this is, even with people who have had significant exper experience in learning other foreign languages and, and, and so forth. You would think, okay, you've been through this. Now you know. You just have to start <laughs> talking to people, right? Mm -hmm. But but still, it's it, we find it uh, a, a challenge for for people to overcome their their anxiousness and, and mm -hmm. so forth. Um, I'm very curious to know to what degree you have seen studies or had experience in in dealing with people who are shy, anxious, etc., about communicating in the target language to help them to to um, you know, I mean, there's certainly this bridging of uh, the, mm -hmm. the activities that, that, that you've suggested, but, but what about strategies for dealing with it head on in terms of you know the self-regulating side? Any, mm -hmm. any any suggestions? Well, I, I mean, I think with anxiety, exposure to exposure to the task or the activity that makes you feel anxious mm -hmm. makes you feel less anxious. Mm -hmm. So the more opportunities you can provide them with exposure to communicating with a native speaker, for example. Um, the more competent and confident, and the more the least the less anxious they're going to feel. Um, so inviting tar inviting native speakers to the classroom, doing Skype interviews. I just did that with an artist from Paris. We invited an artist through Skype to talk with our students. They were so excited. They said she understood me. Yeah, yeah she did. Um, so um, the more opportunities you can give to them to do that um, is great. Where I am having a roundtable next week with uh, at the end of the semester. We talked about in the beginning French one, French identity through a variety of forms of visual media. Now we've studied a variety of different cultural perspectives, and now I'm inviting a roundtable of French speakers to come. And they're developing questions. We're going to help work them work out the questions beforehand, so they feel confident in asking that question, you know. And then they're going to ask these these questions to them, so that so that this isn't sort of the first time they get to that con target country that they're experiencing that. You know, they've had multiple different opportunities to experience. And with, the, with technology today, there's so many ways in which you can expose students to real life encounters like that. Mm -hmm. So I would say that's what I would say probably. Uh, I, those are great. Thank you very much. Uh, we've had a, a, a number of, of, let me just mention, we've had a number of, 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 of sort of generic questions that would be addressed. It looks to me like people might have missed the presentation, so so probably won't take that, those questions that are that are more generic and encourage you to, to, to watch it. Uh, others about male-female differences. Uh, let me just read a, a couple of the a, a couple of those. Uh, one one person asks, why are girls eager to learn more than boys um, other languages? Um, which I'm not sure that that's uh, that's certainly not certainly not always the case, but we we certainly see some uh, uh, um, some evidence for that. And then another person uh, uh, asked about, uh, from my experience, I noticed that girls learn foreign languages faster than boys. We also mentioned that in the webinar. Is that, uh, I'm not sure if that's quite uh, what you said, but anyway, is that because girls like to learn languages more or what? And we're getting a little further afield from, well, not a little, well, uh, but Well, still, I, don't want to, I don't want there to be a misconception that right. um, girls learn foreign languages faster than boys or or that girls are better at foreign languages than boys. But what I will say is that we find that there, that there are more females that are majoring and minoring in our languages at the advanced level. So that I would say, and I would also say that when I had the that table with the the differences in perceived the the self-efficacy differences in cultural comparisons, etc., that was their mean change from the beginning to the end of the language requirement. There were no differences in self-efficacy beliefs between men and women. It was the change in self-efficacy that was different. Mm -hmm. So I don't I don't want to be there this I don't want there to be a misconception that men feel less confident than women do. That's not the case in what I, my research anyway. Um, so and, and I would underscore that 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 the distribution between the commonly taughts and the less commonly taughts of, of gender, uh, it's, 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 it's complex. So, so for example, as just one example, here on campus, our, our male Arabic uh, majors far outweigh female uh, Arabic majors. Just one of those things. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's something that I think that through, 
I really do think that through interview um, and through further exploration, through you know extended interviews with males and females engaged in the language requirement or at the advanced level, I think you could really start to discover some interesting information. We we had some uh, we had some interesting uh, uh, research on this on on uh, I'm trying to remember the sources and uh, some some of you may be able to help me uh, where uh, women were doing much better in one context where men were I believe it was that men in a in a uh, in a larger classroom were, were were doing better but women in a in a smaller classroom uh, would be better than than the men and so it's a it's a very complex this, yeah. this whole um, Influence of, of gender on the on a, it's a complex topic. Any other questions from here? From the uh, please. Um, it seems the way the conversation is going is how do we encourage students? How do we help them manage their own learning process? Mm -hmm. So, what about students who we mentioned before have a, an over inflated sense of accomplishment and success, how do you uh, kind of um, guide them gently but let them know that they actually are not yeah. as... It's very, it's very important that you do that as an instructor and I find that sometimes instructors don't do that enough in the U.S. education. <laughs> My experience in the U.S. I see they seem to see there's more inflation um, of of abilities sometimes in terms of the feedback that's given and I think you have to be really really careful and students that come to your classroom that may have that perception through potentially your feedback within feedback in your compositions within their grades that they're receiving within they're they're they, they're gonna have to reevaluate and often when I find that sort of disconnect I bring that student in and we talk about it because sometimes what's happened is when we talk about if verbal persuasions are influencing self-efficacy beliefs, it could be a student that in every prior class has received inflated feedback or the feedback that they've received wasn't appropriate and not um, rigorous enough. And that can be just as damaging, I think sometimes and so you really have to do that via your via via the comments that you give them and then talk to them one-on-one -on -one saying hey I don't want this to be debilitating <laughs> you wouldn't maybe use that word but I don't want this to be a negative experience for you I want this to be a learning experience for you I'm behind you I want to give you all the resources you can to improve but sometimes that sort of experience for that student of all of a sudden they're not getting the 100% fantastic, fantastic, you know, on their um, composition is devastating. Uh, so having that conversation and being behind them in terms of support is very important. Uh, let's see. Um, um, any other questions from the folks around the table? Um, just out of curiosity, do you have? Is there anywhere we can find more details on the global simulation? Oh yeah, project? yeah. So I, on that website right there, mm -hmm. um, I have I have two articles um, on it. One that talks about the writing self-efficacy that I talked about today, mm -hmm. and I have another one that talks about a Facebook component that was affiliated with the global simulation project. I also have a um, my webinar from last year was about Global simulation. So I think that's on YouTube. Oh, okay. The, yeah. on, the link's on our website. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Well, we are really, really grateful for. Uh, we didn't even look. There's, we didn't even provide a, 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 any water for <laughs> that's ca fine. carrying on nonstop here uh, <laughs> and. Uh, Fascinating. Open. I've had comments from people saying, "This is this is just what I uh, what I needed." I'm thinking about doing a study, and this is helping me narrow it down and oh, and uh, so forth. So th this is this is really really exciting stuff. Th thank you so much for no, coming. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you all for who participated, and we we look forward to uh, to uh, continuing to share and and push the push the frontiers in our understanding of how to help students to succeed and enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you.